the next topic that we'll be discussing uh, will be periodic inspections. We'll use our cutaway engine here um, as a demonstrator to make the process a little bit clearer. Uh, those of you that have seen us and talked to us at the fly-ins uh, will recognize this cutaway. We've, uh, we've taken it all over the country. It seems like uh, wherever we are, the cutaway goes too. It, um, it really does explain uh, better than we could with words the inner operations of a radial engine. Now this is where an operator's manual is a must and the overhaul manual comes in very, very handy in doing this uh, periodic inspection. Now, uh, we're going to be moving the, the crankshaft around, which means with, a, with an aircraft engine we'll have a propeller on it. We'll be moving the propeller around, and one thing that we want to be absolutely certain about is that any time we move that propeller, the magneto switch needs to be off. Um, you may think that you're doing a compression test, but if that mag switch is on, the engine thinks you're trying to hand prop it. And um, you may have a really ugly surprise when it tries to start, and um, if you're lucky, you'll get away with just broken bones. So treat that propeller like a gun. Until you have verified that it's unloaded, you assume it's loaded. So always be sure that the mag switch is off before you, uh, before you move the crankshaft at all. All right? Um, in the operator's manual, we're, we're going to be doing um, what they call a 50-hour inspection, a 50-hour check. And um, in the 50-hour check, some of the items have asterisks beside them. And if we go uh, to the top, it says uh, the definition of the asterisk means that we're supposed to check these items at the first 25-hour inspection after installation and every 100 hours thereafter. So the items in here that are marked with an asterisk are things that get checked uh, 25 hours after the engine is overhauled and then every 100 thereafter. All the other items in this list are checked every 50 hours, all right? Now, I'm going to move quickly through the operations in this uh, manual that are common knowledge things, uh, things that are very similar to what people do with opposed engines. I'm not going to dwell on that a lot because uh, that we already know those things. But what I want to focus on are the, the operations that are specific to the Jacobs engine. Uh, I want to look at those things that, um, that might not be as well known and, uh, and address some of them. Now, the first operation in, in the 50-hour check is the compression check, and it has an asterisk. So it's supposed to be done 25 hours uh, after the engine is installed, and then every 100 hours thereafter. Uh, nothing very uh, magical about a compression test. It's just uh, using a differential compression tester. We're checking the compression of all the cylinders and, and looking for good compression. Uh, number two, the fuel and oil systems. Now there's a little bit different uh, thing there, a little specific thing we want to look at. With the fuel system on the engine we have an NAR7A carburetor and at the bottom of the NAR7A carburetor there's this uh, square brass plug. Attached to that square brass plug is a finger screen and so at every uh, 50 hours we want to cut the safety wire, remove that screen, clean it out and look for debris in it which would give us a, a hint about what might be going on in our fuel tanks and in the rest of the fuel system. So every 50 hours the, the finger strainer in the carburetor is, um, is cleaned. Another thing that will be applicable to nearly all the Jacobs engines out there is the firewall mounted oil screen. Uh, all, well, not all, but almost all of the Cessna 195s were equipped with the firewall mounted oil screen and the Waco YMF5s as well. And there are many other Wacos that, uh, that use this same firewall mounted oil screen. It has, uh, it has an inlet and outlet. The base uh, unbolts with four nuts and there's a, a screen up in there that needs to be uh, cleaned at every uh, 50 hours. Um, in addition to this screen, there's also a coarser screen that is in the sump. You remember we looked at that, that screen that was in the sump and if you put the clean kit on then it screws into the uh, clean kit. Well that screen needs to be uh, removed and cleaned as well. And as long as you've got that screen out of there, it's an excellent opportunity to stick your finger up in the sump and kind of feel around in there. Because if there's any um, debris 
in the engine, it will eventually find its way into the sump. It might not make it all the way into the screen, but might just settle out into the bottom of the sump there. You can feel around, and um, uh, if you're fortunate, you won't find anything. <laughs> so um, so that, uh, that also needs to be done. The next item, uh, number three, is the ignition system. And we're going to spend some time with the ignition system because that, uh, the ignition system on a Jacobs engine is a little bit uh, different critter than what you may be used to seeing. And, but before we get into the operations that they describe in that manual, uh, I want to talk about something that's not in the manual at all, which has to do with determining where top dead center is. Um, we have to time the, the distributor in uh, for the R755A2 and B2 at uh, one degree before top dead center and the, uh, the magneto gets timed at 31 degrees before top dead center. Well, how do we find those accurately? Uh, I have a time right which is uh, screwed into the number one spark plug hole and many people use the time right as the only device to determine top dead center. The problem with only using the time right is that as you get close to top dead center, the piston stops moving. It does that because there's a lot of play in the entire, uh, in the gear train, uh, in the master rod, master rod bearing. So in other words, if I, if I move the crankshaft, it's approaching top dead center, getting close, getting close, getting close. Okay, the, the piston has stopped moving. It's still not moving. Even though I'm moving the crankshaft, now it's moving again. So in, in this much movement, the piston wasn't moving. Well, where is top dead center? Is it here, here, here? Well, we know it's exactly halfway between the time that it stopped moving and it started moving again, but that's, we're going to have to estimate that. The time right has no idea. It, it stopped moving as soon as the piston stopped moving. And so we could, with the time right, you can get within a couple, three, maybe four degrees um, but we really want our timing closer than that. So what we're doing here is we're using a time right to help us to find top dead center along with a protractor. This is a, a factory Jacobs uh, protractor uh, timing disc. It's just a 360 degree protractor scribed all the way around. It has an indicator that bolts onto the, um, to the thrust bearing cover and, and points at it. So the question might become, do I have to pull the propeller off every time in order to check the timing? And the answer is no. You don't have to use this protractor. Uh, there is also a commercial device that, is, uh, that uh, you know, slips over the end of your propeller over the spinner and uh, uses rubber bands or bungees to hold it on, and it's weighted. Well, that device will, will serve the same purpose as our protractor here, but still we can use that device along with the time right to really zero in on top dead center and get it right at top dead center before we begin to time the engine. That way we can feel confident that, uh, that we're right on. It's easy with using the protractor and the time right to, uh, to get the timing within half a degree. And, uh, and that's, that's plenty close. So what I'd like to do is I would like to uh, zoom in on all this and I'll walk through what we're going to do with, uh, with the time right and the protractor, and uh, I think it'll be very obvious what we're doing to determine top dead center. All right, we've got this roughly set at zero now. What I've done is just using the time right, I've watched the time right arm until it, I estimate that that's about top dead center. So I loosened the set screw on the back of the, um, of the protractor, and I zeroed it with the pointer. So it's, it's roughly top dead center now. So what we'll do now is we will we'll back this thing up and using, you'll see that I've put a red mark on, um, on the time right. Now you don't have to put a red mark on yours if you don't want to. Just use a piece of tape, but we're not going to use the card that usually slips in there. We're, we just want a reference mark on here. And that's what I've done is I've, I've made a reference mark. So we're going to we're going to move the crankshaft and we're moving it away from top dead center and then we're going to bring it back down again until the arm, the top of the arm is at the top of my red mark. Now we're going to read the, uh, the protractor. We read the protractor, the protractor says 34 degrees. Alright, so we know that it, on this side of top dead center it reads 34 degrees. 
Now let's go to the other side. You see we're coming back towards top dead center, zero someplace in there. Okay, we go get it back, and now we're going to bring it back. We're bringing it back down again so that it, the top of the arm matches the top of the red line. Okay, and now we read it. We've got 29 degrees. Okay, so there's a, there's a difference. On one side we had 34, on the other side we have 29. That's a 5 degree difference. Now what we know now is we just took all the, the play out of all the gear train and everything, there's a 5 degree difference. So the place where zero is is actually 2.5 degrees inside of that 5 degree bracket. So we can either take 2.5 degrees away from 34 degrees and come up with 31.5 degrees, or we can add 2.5 degrees to 29 and still come up with 31.5 degrees. But what that means is that our pointer, rather than pointing at 29 or 34, needs to point at 31.5. So we'll loosen the set screw and we'll move it very slightly to 31.5 degrees. All right, now we can go back to the other side and check it. Okay, we go past and we bring it back down again so that it's just at the top of the line and we check it and we're at 31.5 degrees. So what, what we've done now is taken all the backlash out of the system <clears throat> so that we know that when we bring it down here and we set it at zero, it truly is at zero. Probably better than half a degree. But we've taken all the backlash out of the system doing this and we verified that, that now our protractor is zeroed. And once our protractor is zeroed, we're finished with the time right. It was just a tool to help us find top dead center. So we can take it out now. And it's easier for me to take mine out than it is for you to take yours out, because you have to thread yours out, and mine is in a cutaway cylinder. So now we can go around. We can set up our engine at 31 degrees before top dead center. Okay, 31 degrees before top dead center. That's where our magneto will be timed, and that's where we'll check the distributor. So now we're ready. We've got it set at 31 degrees before top dead center on the compression stroke, and we're ready to go around behind the engine now and begin to do our timing with the magneto and the distributor. This is the Bendix Centilla VMN7 DF5 magneto that um, is used with the Jacobs engine. The first instruction that we have in our 50-hour check is lubricate the magneto by adding 20 to 30 drops of SAE 40 oil into the oil cup on the front end plate and 5 to 8 drops of oil into the oil cup on the magneto coil cover. So what they're asking us to do is put 20 to 30 drops of oil in this little spring-loaded um, oiler and it says add 5 to 8 drops of oil to this little spring-loaded oiler. Now this is a, an example where we have um, OEM manuals conflicting because the uh, Jacobs Operator's Manual was written in 1948. In 1955, Bendix Centilla, the manufacturer of the Magneto, came out with a service bulletin, service bulletin number 327. And service bulletin 327 agrees with those Jacobs instructions about oiling this one. But the service bulletin says that this a uh, little oiler cup should be soldered closed and should never be oiled. That the only oil that will reach the magneto rear bearing will be the grease that is packed in there at the time of overhaul. In addition to that, there are some other modifications to the, uh, to the front plate that that ser service bulletin calls out. And I'll show you what that looks like. This is, the, uh, this is the front plate. You'll see that uh, it, it has this, uh, this same post here. Um, this post, can, you know, is, uh, is that one. Okay, the other thing that they call for in the service bulletin is deepening this channel so that this uh, large gear can receive more lubrication. And you can see this passage, which is actually where this uh, oil oils that, uh, that wick. 
There is another passage that you can't see that comes down here, runs around this direction, and originally oiled the front bearing. In the service bulletin, they instruct us to take a piece of soft wire and force it down into that passage so that oil can no longer pass through that passage, but only through this passage. It's amazing how many times we find magnetos that have been uh, left alone and not modified, even overhauled repeatedly since 1955, but this service bulletin is not done. If this service bulletin is not complied with, I just don't think there's any way that we can expect this magneto to uh, reach TBL with the engine. It may last three, four hundred hours, but there's no way that it can, uh, that it can last the twelve hundred hours that the engine can. So this is an important service bulletin uh, to comply with. Uh, the easy way for you to tell whether yours has been done is check this coil cover oiler. Is that still open? Because if it's still open, then that service bulletin has not been complied with. Um, another important thing with the magnetos, and it's, it's not really possible for, us, for me to show you uh, the part that I'm describing, but the rotating magnet inside the magneto, which is the uh, is on the magneto shaft, uh, needs to be periodically recharged. Uh, at every overhaul it should be recharged because it loses its magnetism over time. And uh, we find a lot of magnets that are very weak and what it does is it produces a very weak spark. And so if your magnet has not been recharged, uh, it's a good idea to, at the same time as you're having your uh, um, your service bulletin complied with, have the magnet charged because you'll, you'll be amazed at how much better the engine starts. Okay, first thing we want to do here is remove the coil cover. Uh, this is, um, this is the, the contact points cover. We can rotate the, um, the lever into the retard position, remove the contact points cover, and then there are just two screws that hold the uh, coil cover in place. We'll take those out and it'll give us a, a better view of the internal so that we can inspect the coil, the condenser, the rotating cylinder and see if there's anything visually that um, might give us a clue what's going on. Okay, we have the, the coil itself, the condenser, the rotating cylinder. This is the gear that, uh, that is lubricated by that, uh, that oil that's put in that little, um, in that little oil cup and then here are our point assemblies. So um, the book calls out the, the clearance for the points. It says uh, check the magneto breaker points for proper clearance of 10 to 14 thousandths, preferably 12 thousandths. When the, when the magneto is overhauled it's set to 12 thousandths. So we'll, we'll check the points now and see what the adjustment on the points is. That's a 12 thousandths feeler gauge and it feels about right so I think the points in this magneto are in good shape. If we needed to uh, to adjust them we would need two one quarter inch end wrenches. We would loosen the lock nut and then adjust the fixed point in or out depending on uh, on what clearance that we needed. So that's really it. If we, if we have the points adjusted uh, in the magneto, then, um, then the only thing that's left to check is the magneto timing. And we'll check the distributor uh, points first, and then we'll check the distributor and magneto timing. This is our Bendix Scintilla WL7A battery ignition uh, distributor. And um, uh, this is the unit that's most often found on the Jacobs engines on the right hand side firing the front spark plugs. Now occasionally this entire accessory drive unit will be removed and a second magneto will be put here at the expense of losing the propeller governor drive. But in, um, on all the Cessna 195's uh, and on any of the WACOs that utilize a uh, 2B20 constant speed propeller you'll usually find the battery ignition. Now the battery ignition points are adjusted much like the magneto points were. The uh, instructions that we have are check the battery ignition distributor breaker points for proper clearance. The clearance should be 14 to 18, preferably 16. 
Now, Bendix and Tilla was very kind to us here. They embossed into the case, contact opening 16,000. So that makes life a lot easier uh, for us to remember. So we brought the uh, cam around so that it, the uh, follower is on the lobe of a cam. And now we're going to check, again, the point clearance with a 16,000 feeler gauge. And that feels about right. So we won't need to make any adjustments to, uh, to that unit. If we did need to make adjustments, we would loosen these two screws and they give us these little pry spots so that we can pry on the fixed point and, uh, and move it to where we need to have it. Now, when we go to retighten these screws, it's important not to over tighten the screws. The underneath this base, this little phenolic with these brass inserts in it is what these screws thread into. If you over tighten the screws, it causes this phenolic to crack. The brass moves up, contacts the housing, and shorts it out. The front, part, front spark plugs quit firing. So it's important not to, uh, not to over tighten that if you need to adjust them. Now while you've got the, uh, the distributor apart, it's also an excellent opportunity to inspect the distributor cap. Uh, you can look at it, inspect it for cracks, uh, look at the, um, at the terminals uh, for wear. Uh, this little carbon brush is important. The little carbon there, all the uh, electricity in the system is passed through this carbon brush and it will eventually wear down so that it's even with its little brass housing here. When it does that, the engine stops running very well. So inspect it and make sure that there's, there's plenty of, uh, of carbon left there. The other part that you um, should inspect at this same time is the rotating finger. Uh, the finger is um, another key component here. You'll notice that the, um, the finger is free to move. This is the advance mechanism that is designed into this distributor. In this position, the distributor is fully retarded and um, it is designed to be timed at about one degree before top dead center for starting, for easy starting. Then as the engine runs, there are little flyweights underneath this unit that begin to throw out. And as they do, they advance the timing around uh, 15 degrees of distributor advance, which gives us 30 degrees of engine advance so that when it's running uh, at rated power, we're up around 31 degrees before top dead center. So both the magneto and the distributor are fully advanced running uh, 31 degrees before top dead center. We'll check the timing on the distributor both locations, both the starting timing, which should be one degree, and also the, uh, the fully advanced timing. Now, if there's one that's more critical than the other, the fully advanced timing certainly is. Um, the engine would start and run well at one degree before top dead center, one degree after, um, but, uh, but we really want it at 31 degrees before top dead center when it's fully advanced. So we'll, we'll check that both ways. So let me get a timing light and we'll check these units. All right, we have our timing light uh, connected up to it. We've grounded it to the housing. We've got the uh, positive side going over to the, uh, to the fixed points. And what we'll do now, I've got the, um, the crankshaft set at, um, at one degree before top dead center, which is where this is supposed to be timed in the, in the fully retarded position. So we'll turn it on. And on the right side, our light isn't on yet. I've got the, uh, the mounting bolts loose, so we'll move it until the points just open and the light comes on. Okay, so now we've got the, the points just opening in the fully retarded position at, um, at one degree before top dead center. All right, now I've readjusted the crankshaft to 31 degrees before top dead center, and we'll check it again in the fully advanced position. We turn it on, the points are closed, we advance it around, and just as it hits a stop, the points open. All 
All right. So this one, this magneto or this distributor truly is a 15 degree advanced distributor. It, um, it's at one degree before top dead center when it's fully retarded and 31 degrees before top dead center fully advanced. All right, we've got the, um, the crankshaft set at 31 degrees before top dead center. And now we're going to check the magneto timing. The points are not open yet. Should be able to adjust this. Okay, that's the point where they're just opening. So we can tighten the magneto up and uh, and the mag and distributor are now timed. The next issue with um, our periodic inspection is the valve adjustment. Um, we have brought the number one piston up to top dead center on the compression stroke. We have our turning bar pointing at the cylinder. And um, so what we're going to do now is adjust the valves. The, uh, the operator's manual says the correct valve clearance for both intake and exhaust valves is eight thousandths, but do not disturb the clearance of a valve which shows seven to twelve thousandths clearance. If resetting is required, adjust the clearance to eight thousandths. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through the firing order. We're going to adjust the intake and exhaust on uh, number one, then we'll move down to number three, then to five, then to seven, then to two, then to four, then to six, and that will bring us back up to one again. And we've adjusted, we're adjusting and going through and resetting to eight thousandths uh, cold running clearance. Now at that point, we have, we have set everything, but we need to run through that two revolution cycle two more times. So we'll, by the time we've adjusted the valves completely, we've gone through six revolutions of the crankshaft. Now why do we need to do that? We need to do that because the cam in a Jacobs engine is a three lobe cam for the intake track and a three lobe cam for the exhaust track. So what we, when we've gone through two revolutions, we've basically adjusted for one lobe of the cam. Now in adjusting for the second and the third lobes, what we need to do is run through and just verify for the second and third lobes that nothing is tighter than seven thousandths. As long as nothing is tighter than seven thousandths, if it's looser, that's not a problem. We just can't have anything tighter than seven thousandths. So and there will be some small variations in the cam, so, so we'll experience that. But let's say on the, on the second lobe we find one that's at six, then we need to loosen it to eight. And that means on the first lobe, it will be even looser than eight, but that's okay. We just can't, uh, it can't run with anything tighter than seven. Um, another question that sometimes comes up is if you look in the overhaul manual, it talks about adjusting the valves to 35 and 40 thousandths. Now the adjustment that it's talking about there is strictly for setting up the cam timing in the first place. It has nothing to do with a running clearance. So don't ever adjust the valves to 35 and 40 thousandths to run the engine. We have seen that a couple of times and believe it or not the engine runs and even runs pretty good. But uh, right away the valves are slapping uh, or the rockers are slapping the valves and it's not very long before the top of the valve begins to mushroom. And so it'll run that way for a while. But the, the number that we're going for is eight thousandths. And um, one other thing, at, when you have your rocker covers off, inspect the rocker covers. There, uh, there are two ribs on the rocker cover uh, on the inside, reinforcing ribs. Sometimes you'll notice that the rocker arm is actually striking the rocker cover on one of the ribs. Uh, that's because as the valve recedes back into the seat, just from normal wear, the, the rocker begins to rise in its adjustment and will begin to hit the rocker cover. If that happens, you need to go in and very carefully relieve that, uh, that rocker cover just a little bit to give the rocker arm some clearance. Otherwise, the valve is, um, is not really opening fully. Well, that, uh, that about sums up the, uh, the valve adjustment. The only other thing that I'd like to, to re-emphasize in, um, in the uh, periodic maintenance portion is um, that issue of retorquing the cylinder base nuts. 
It's something that just doesn't get done as frequently as the operator's manual calls for it. Um, without uh, baffle modifications, it is a lot of trouble and you, you do have to pull all the baffles, but, uh, but it's very essential that those uh, cylinder base nuts be retorqued at the first 25 hours after overhaul and then every 100 thereafter. It, uh, it will save much expense down the line uh, and possibly even a forced landing if you stay on top of, uh, of adjusting those, uh, those cylinder base nuts.